Let's thank David one more time, and then we'll jump right into this five-minute talk. So the uh, usual rules apply. We're going to try and whip through as many five-minute talks as we have time for. We're a little short on time. So there's the list. Know who's up. Uh, looks like Leon is first, first up. So if you're here, let's come on up and get started. Let's minimize uh, time. Just stay on the list. I'm not going to interrupt people unless I need to. Just come on up through. All right. Uh, I'm running these slides. I'm going to talk through them, talk over top of them, because uh, it's going to keep me on track in terms of what it is that I wanted to talk about. I work with the National Association of Mathematicians. What you see are pictures from uh, a meeting that we have every fall. Uh, it's called Math Fest, uh, called uh, NAMS Undergraduate Math Fest, so there's no confusion. Right. Uh, we've been doing that for over 20 years, where we bring in students uh, from a number of institutions, typically historically black colleges. Uh, but we also have uh, deal with a number of summer research programs. And the big emphasis that we have for the program is that we talk about, uh, we have student presentations, right? We require the students, when they do the student presentations, to uh, give an oral presentation. We have no poster sessions. We hear a lot of complaints about that. You know, they say, where are the poster sessions? No poster sessions. We get calls from the faculty and say, you know, our student wants to present. They want to do a poster. Do you have any facility for it? No. We don't. Can you do some? No, we can't. <laughs> well, we have this idea. We think, no, that's not going to happen. You know, what we do is we require the students to stand in front of approximately 100 people and do a presentation, right? That way, they really have command of what it is that they are talking about. That's the way we feel about it. Uh, now, uh, very few of you know me. Some of you do know me. Um, more of you will know uh, Nate Dean. You know, Nathaniel Dean works with me uh, with this program, or I work with him. He's the president of the organization. Uh, now, what happened about five years ago was uh, that, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, uh, Education Advancement Foundation uh, really kind of approach, approached us, approached us aggressively. Uh, and I uh, have to apologize to, uh, to Mick, Mr. Lucas, but uh, thank you. Mr. Lucas, <laughs> for, uh, for your efforts to uh, do some things with us. So uh, in terms of the student presentations, uh, because of a heavy dose, and that's been for the last five years, of uh, considerations with uh, the Moore method. You know, prior to that, uh, we didn't do a lot with it. Even we did things with it, and I didn't know. Uh, I, I had a, a course that was uh, inquiry-based learning, and I didn't know it until about 15 years later. You know, that's a story in itself, but I'm not going to cut into my, my 10 minutes. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but in the last nine years, I've been working with uh, Marshall Cohen. Some of you may also know him. Uh, he was a student of... Uh, Morton Brown, and Morton Brown was a student of Bing. And he, uh, he and I have uh, collaborated on a number of things, as I have with uh, Nate Dean. But uh, our program, one of the things that we emphasize, like I said, is research. Undergraduate research is a big, big part of our program. And uh, another thing that we have in terms of programs, we have the winter meeting. Uh, at the joint meetings, we bring in students uh, for that. We also have a program for recent PhDs. And that's been really fruitful. About 20 years ago, it's been over 20 years that we've run the program. Uh, but about 20 years ago, uh, there were only about six uh, African Americans getting PhDs in mathematics uh, every year. You know, on average, you know, it'd be eight one year, four another, two. Uh, now it's about 25 every year, in the mid-20s that we have. So that's allowed us to really alter some of the programs that we've, we've had. Uh, because of that, our summer program, which you're seeing, I'm sorry, our spring program, which you're seeing some pictures of, is geared toward faculty. 
faculty development. And the last five years, it's been, you, you, no. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. Last, last five years, it's been, uh, uh, the Moore Method has been, you know, the key factor that we've had for those programs. Uh, bringing in a lot of the young students, that's been really helpful. And my two uh, stories that I had to tell, uh, uh, if you want to hear them, see me later. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, the Journal of Inquiry-Based Learning and Mathematics is a peer-reviewed internet journal which publishes inquiry-based uh, course notes. Uh, for those of you who are new, it's on, uh, on the web. Uh, my purpose today is to talk about uh, uh, drawing a bit of a picture on the statistical, uh, 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 st some statistical findings that uh, we've been picking up over the last year or so. So uh, there's a picture of, the, uh, of what you'll see when you go on the web. I'll tell you in a moment how to get there. So uh, the, uh, the journal, uh, uh, in terms of what's being downloaded, the journal involves itself with um, a number of um, um, original manuscripts from authors. Uh, what you're looking at is a uh, line bar of uh, monthly uh, downloads from the internet. Each download represents one manuscript being downloaded. The line across the middle there uh, indicates 500 entries per month. So we're running in excess of 500 entries per month. And in particular, uh, over the course of the last 12 months, from June of last year to June of this year, uh, we're looking at 6,800 down there in yellow, 6,800 downloads across uh, approximately 32 separate issues. Uh, we are growing at the rate of two to three issues per year. And so uh, the, uh, the amount of uh, uh, access to the journal, that is what's being accessed, is what you're seeing right here. I've placed things in categories just to give you a sense of the types of things that are being downloaded. Uh, analysis and foundations and calculus are our three best sellers, so to speak. Uh, but uh, we have a large uh, uh, variety of different types of mathematics that can be uh, um, um, accessed on the web. Another part of the, uh, another part of things, hello. How many total number of manuscripts are on the journal? 32. 32, thank that's you. On the, that's on the actual Journal of Inquiry-Based Learning. Uh, there are more on math nerds, and uh, I'll show you in a moment how to get to them, okay? Um, the, uh, the second part, the second lines, uh, authors, when they, su when they uh, uh, submit their uh, manuscripts, often will uh, give a second uh, um, uh, manuscript, which is uh, for instructors, uh, annotated with comments and uh, um, um, information that they, will uh, that they find useful. Um, we've started tracking that as of September last year, and you can see uh, we have a constant sort of ratio running between instructor and student downloads. This is actually a key that professionals are more interested in this site than students are, so we can predict behaviors based on this sort of situation. Okay, so that's what's being downloaded. Who's downloading it is probably a little more interesting, uh, at least as far as I'm concerned. Uh, this is a density map of uh, uh, downloads by country across the planet for the last 12 months. There's a gradient bar down there in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, 6,648 is the darkest color anywhere, and that's the United States, which is expected. But it's the rest of the planet that's so interesting in this particular regard. Uh, if we look at some of the, uh, if we look at some of the top 10 or so downloads by country over the last 12 months, not only will you notice uh, the Western civilization uh, countries uh, uh, such as uh, United Kingdom, Australia, Canada being represented, but quite literally uh, pieces from across the planet. As a matter of fact, we have 76 countries uh, that we have now tracked as downloading manuscripts from this website over the last 12 months. This year was the first year that China has actually been tracked as downloading manuscripts. We've been doing this for just about two years now. So it appears that the, uh, the journal is using the internet fairly effectively in that it's uh, uh, finding its way across the planet. Um, the other big piece uh, that I just wanted to flesh out really quickly is um, if we're going to talk about uh, the, largest, uh, the largest user of the site, it's of course the United States. Uh, but the United States data is a little difficult to get, my ha to get uh, our hands on at the moment. So what I've done is I've used a proxy, which is visits to the site. A visit is not an interaction with a web page. It's an interaction with the website. 
Uh, the numbers correspond very closely in the aggregate with the total numbers that we get for downloads. So this is a pretty good representation of who's accessing and downloading in the country. Again, you see large population states are, are clearly in control here. However, the top three spots seem to vary a lot. Last year, it was California and Texas up at the top. This year, Pennsylvania has popped right up to the top. Texas and California being large-scale users uh, uh, showing their stuff. Um, this is the first year also that all 50 states have uh, contributed or accessed the website, and uh, uh, Washington, D.C. has also been put into it. So that's just a quick overview, just a sense of what it is that we're doing over here. If you Google J-I-B-L-M, Jiblam, uh, it will take you to the website, and you'll see this page with the, with the little green bars. If you want to find these issues and see what's going on, just hit the Contents tab. Uh, if you're interested or are contemplating uh, uh, authoring for the journal, the Authors tab has information for such things. And if you're looking for a more widespread collection of materials, the Unrefereed Notes section has predecessor manuscripts that existed before the journal came into being. They're very high quality, they're very useful, and they can be used for many different situations. And that's about it. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jane Cushman. I'm at Buffalo State College. And I'm here to tell you about our Western New York IBL support group. We actually um, started meeting after Patrick Walt and I attended IBL prep workshop here, I believe it was two years ago. And we've started to spread IBL in Western New York, primarily by having uh, monthly dinners to start with, because we had a couple of people in the Rochester area, uh, primarily at Nazareth College, and somebody at St. John Fisher, who wanted to start using IBL, so Patrick and I really wanted to help support them in their beginning usage of IBL. So we actually would meet, unfortunately, in Rochester <laughs> more often than in Buffalo, although I did tempt them to come get buffalo wings. Um, so we actually have had a lot of success with that. Uh, Patrick organized guest speakers to come. Um, he also had a mentee from the University of Toronto, Mississauga? Mississauga that came to, to visit in Western New York as well as um, entertain us at dinner. So um, food has been a very big component of our support group. Um, seems if you feed them, they will come. Uh, but we are also expanding. So we're thinking about um, applying for a large grant to try to help expand our support group to maybe include Potsdam and Plattsburgh, which are the upper parts of New York State. Thank you. Always looking for ways to uh, expand the uh, gospel of uh, IBL. We thought it would be interesting, uh, Stan and I, to do some short interviews of our colleagues here and put together a video of one minute clips that kind of summarized how IBL was being used in the classroom. And uh, so we've interviewed four people for this meeting. I'm gonna show you the video here in just a second. And if anybody else would like to participate, uh, we invite you to do that. And if we had 60 one-minute clips, we'd have an hour of video that would make a very interesting composite a quality world of what's going on with IBL in the classroom. I have in common with traditional Moore method an axiomatic development of a collection of problems that, that requires the students to engage with the definitions and to work through in a very rigorous way um, a certain collection of results. But my style differs somewhat from the traditional style in that I do allow a textbook as a reference, and I've just designed the problems in a way that the textbook is not directly usable as a reference for those problems. In some courses I've taught, I've had group assignments or even group homework that's graded once for the group, which differs from the traditional way. But, um, but in common with traditional Moore method, a very large point, part of the class time is devoted to students presenting their work and discussing it with each other in a shared setting, while I facilitate the discussion but otherwise contribute relatively little at that point. When I look at the work of IBL, I think of the works of R.L. Moore, 
where students go to the board, you're giving a proof statement and you have to prove it. And the more you prove it, he gives a new task for you to keep unpacking and unpacking to get to the core of the mathematics, to link the ideas together. However, in education, there are variations of how IBL could be interpreted. Some person may consider that to be a form of a reform-based approach to learning. Some person may think of that as a problem-based approach to learning. So there are variations to that notion within the classroom setting from an education perspective. So with that said, as, an as a mathematics teacher educator, I think of it as a form of promoting reasoning and constructing viable arguments within this setting. So for example, the standard for mathematical practice highlight that you know, reasoning is a very critical piece, but efforts must be made to also promote students constructing viable arguments. And the, the IBL method is really promoting those standards for mathematical practice within the classroom setting. For me, inquiry-based learning is a way of teaching that uh, is active for the students and student-centered. Uh, and the most important part is to get as much of the coursework as you can on the student's shoulders. So in particular, I want to, I have several questions that I ask myself to consider. Um, who is responsible for developing the materials that happen, you know, the mathematics that happens in class? Who's responsible for presenting that to the rest of the class? Who's responsible for critiquing arguments that are discussed? Uh, who's responsible for being the final arbiter of this is correct or not? Uh, as much as possible, I want those, the answer to each of those questions to be the students. And as little as possible, me. And I have to participate in them to some extent to help set culture and to teach them how to behave. But when I can, I let go of those. So one of the things that I have come to understand through my research is that it's not bad to lecture. It's not bad to do inquiry-based learning. It's not, it's not bad. Those things are not bad. They have a purpose and they have a, 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 a space for where they are more productive. One thing that is very interesting about inquiry-based learning is that teachers find that balance within what they are doing. They know how much they have to lecture. They know how much they have to do group work. They know how much to push the students. So inquiry-based learning gives them the space to do that exploration. So in my dream, a lot of faculty, especially adjunct faculty, part-time faculty who are responsible for a substantial teaching in this country would be, a, would be encouraged to learn these techniques and start applying them in their classrooms. So in my dream, we would do a lot of professional development, faculty development for faculty in mathematics who are teaching either full-time or adjuncts and community colleges would be my priority because we are doing a lot of instruction um, in, this, in this country in mathematics in those places and we haven't really tackled that. This is going to be very low tech. That's my slide. My name is Justin Lanier. Um, I'm a middle and high school math teacher. Over the last seven years that's happened at St. Anne's School in Brooklyn, New York. And I want to start by saying thank you to all of you uh, for a middle and high school teacher to be at our conference with, with college professors um, is, is kind of intimidating. And I want to thank you for being so welcoming, both in my personal interactions with you all and in the kind of discourse that I've heard and been a part of uh, in the sessions. Uh, it's in both eye-opening and encouraging to hear the, the kind of things that you all care about in your own teaching and in mathematics. So thank you. Um, Instead of sharing about how inquiry and discovery play out in my own classroom, I want to share with you two endeavors um, that I'm involved with that have to do with um, outreach and community building online. And I hope that you'll find them to be useful. Uh, the first is called Math Munch. It's a blog that I write with two of my colleagues on a weekly basis where we share with our students uh, inter um, the mathematical internet, um, that is to say, we share sites and videos and games and links and articles and interviews that expand our students' conception and experience of mathematics. Um, and I want to share it with you for, for three reasons. Um, one is that I think it might be useful to you in your work with future teachers. Um, I've had good conversations with folks here over the last couple of days about your work with future teachers and your efforts to expand their understanding of what mathematics is and how people can engage with it. 
Um, and so sharing MathMunch with them might both expand their own understandings and it might be useful to them in their future practice um, because we have a For Teachers page where um, teachers around the country and world have started sharing MathMunch with their own students in the way that the three of us, um, Anna Weltman, Paul Solomon, and myself, um, share um, the world of math with our own students. Um, uh, the second reason I share math much with you is that um, it's, a, it's a venue for mathematicians, you all. Um, it's us curating your work um, to our students to make it accessible, to give it a human face, um, so that the, the research that you do and the more recreational things that you do, the, all the parts of mathematics that you love, we want our students and students around the country to, to see and experience that. Um, and then, uh, Finally, uh, I, I offer it as, as a bright spot for any time that you're feeling discouraged about some aspect of K-12 education to know that um, this is one thing that's happening out there. Um, the second thing that I wanna share with you, the second endeavor has to do with online communities. Um, and it's this thing that's called Math Twitter Blogosphere. Um, and over the last, I don't know, five or six years, I've been increasingly involved with group, a, a loosely aligned group of um, mostly K-12 teachers, but, but also professional mathematicians and teacher educators online um, through writing on blogs and through um, interacting on Twitter. Um, and it's been the most transformative uh, professional development of, of my career. Uh, and I share it with you, again, for three reasons. One, because I think it might be useful to you um, with your work with future teachers. Um, classroom teaching, uh, or classroom teachers, it's great whenever, um, when we can have support in local networks, and I've gotten to hear some great ways in which you all support K-12 teachers in their practice through, um, through workshops and through, um, through local, local community building. Uh, but it can be really isolating, and there are lots of late nights when you're scratching your head, and you're like, what am I gonna do with my kids tomorrow? I wish I had better resources. Um, and the, the math ed Twitter blogosphere um, is has been an enormous resource. Uh, if you if you Google Math Twitter Blogosphere, you'll land on a, a site that a group of um, a group of folks from around the country have put together as an introduction to how you can get started as a as a K twelve teacher with blogging and with being on Twitter. Um, the second reason that I mention it is because. Um, I've been really impressed by the ways in which you all keep in touch with each other, the, the formal and informal structures that you all have as an IBL community and as a, as a college professor community to, to be in touch, um, and I've learned things from that. Um, and I offer um, blogs and Twitter as a, another possible venue for you all to connect with each other. I was struck by some of the statistics yesterday that um, in the session about um, where IBL classes are being taught and how there are some places where there's uh, one, only one individual at a given university who's doing IBL, um, and this can be a good way for people to connect who are, who are doing that. Um, the, and I, I also offer this as a bright spot whenever you're frustrated with what's happening in K-12, that there are many, many, many passionate and dedicated educators uh, all the time interacting, try to, trying to improve their practice. Uh, and finally, I'll just plug it by saying, uh, a week ago, I didn't know about this conference, um, and then I saw a tweet um, by a teacher friend of mine uh, talking about the, the Art of Mathematics program, and then I asked him, where did you run across that? And he pointed me to a blog post, and I read the blog post, and the author of it said that she was hoping to come to this and couldn't make it, and I said, well, gosh, Austin's just a plane right away, and I registered, and here I am. Uh, so thank you so much, um, and yeah, that's all. I'm Ben Woodruff from Brigham Young University, Idaho. I guess if I had to put one question up that summarized my five minute talk, it would be who should struggle with the key ideas, the students or the teachers, and then design your course accordingly. Um, when I, I never experienced any kind of more method class or any kind of inquiry based learning class through my education. It was always lecture, go home, do the homework. And upon getting a job at Brigham Young University, Idaho, um, showed up in a culture where very often uh, what would happen is the teachers would start by lecturing a little at the beginning of the day, and then they would, after demonstrating the key ideas, send the students to the boards and have them practice. 
and they would start with some simple problems and the students in groups of three or four would tackle a whole bunch of problems together and 40 minutes of every class period was basically devoted to slowly building up your ability to do mathematics. And I got thrown into that culture and loved it. Um, the, I was doing that for many years and about three years ago I felt maybe there's something missing and uh, was struggling with that for about a year and met Ted. Um, thank you, Ted, wherever you're at. Uh, Ted Mahavier came and talked to our uh, Intermountain MAA section and gave a talk about transformative experiences and a modified more method which involves students preparing more out of class. This gets back to the question, who should struggle with the key ideas, me or the students? And in, uh, when, I, when I would show up to class and, and give a, a short lecture followed by lots of presentations, I was the one struggling with the big idea, getting him through that part. And then they would uh, spend the rest of the hour kind of following what I did and slowly building up some of the ideas. But the, the big struggle was me. And because, because of the conference, I decided to use Ted's materials. And uh, the next semester, this was two years ago, um, I decided to use his materials to teach Calc 1 and Calc 2 in the fall of uh, 2011. It was great. I had a great time, and it was, it was fun to see the students work. There were some rough spots where we got stuck on uh, center of mass problem for four days. Um, <laughs> they moved on past other parts, but that center of mass problem kept coming back again and again. But the students had a good time. It was great. The next semester, I decided to uh, use it in multivariable calculus and, write, and use my own notes. It's a class that I've taught many, many, many times. And um, wrote some materials, and here's just, there's, this is the summary of what happened. Generally, in that class, we have about 75% pass after you get rid of those who just leave. And I'm not sure that's a normal around the nation, but I've talked with other people and in multivariable calculus often, and you, know, you don't have the highest pass rate. And um, this winter semester I did it, I had 95% of the students make it through the course. And I was, happy. And the other thing that happened was every single one of the students bought in. At the end of the semester, I had every single person with the same presentation score at the end of the semester. So I was like, maybe this is just a fluke and I got a great group of students. Next semester, oh, other thing is the exams throughout the semester were similar to what I'd done in the past and the averages were 10% higher all semester long. Next semester, did the same thing, except I had two classes, the afternoon class bought in, same results. 10% higher exams, 95% pass rate. The morning class at 7.45 a.m. didn't buy in. So yeah, they didn't have the same pass rates. And here's the odd thing. The pass rate was what it used to be before I swapped. The exam scores were what it used to be before I swapped. And so what I took away from that was I'm doing them no harm if they don't even buy in. But if they'll buy in, holy cow, there's so much good that can come. When I ask them to go home and think about key ideas, and they come and present those. And I'll end with that. My name is Linda May. I've never been an IBL teacher, but I've been married to one for 48 years. And I have some words of encouragement for those of you who are new practitioners of the method. It takes courage to walk into your class not knowing what is going to happen that day. It takes courage to allow long periods of silence to give your students a chance to think. And it takes courage to allow long periods of silence while a student is struggling. It takes courage to keep believing in IBL when students complain that you're not teaching. It takes courage when other members of your department are critical and saying you're not adequately covering the syllabus. It takes courage when you're not given multi-semester course sequences to teach because your department chair says that one semester of IBL might not hurt the students, but two or more definitely will. It takes grace when the faculty teaching award committee comes to sit in on your class, and that day, the entire class consists of students presenting their work, and other students asking questions, and still other students providing the answer, 
and you think it's the best class ever, but you don't get the award because the committee thought you didn't do anything, and in fact, they wonder why you were ever nominated in the first place. It takes grace when one of, say, Dr. Smith's students comes to you for help because she's so smart that nobody can understand her. It takes grace to be thrilled when one of your students thinks of something that you've never thought of. It takes dedication to break all that material down into pieces that are accessible by your students. It takes courage to teach, and it takes courage to teach in a non-traditional way, but in a way that allows you to be true to yourself and to your students. I've loved listening to you all during these meetings over the years, and I'm deeply impressed by your enthusiasm and your love for your students. This will be our last uh, five-minute talk here from Bob. So I just want to bring to your attention a journal. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, IBL is about students uh, <clears throat> doing work for themselves, uh, proving things. And every now and again, they'll prove something which is new, uh, some original research. And if it's at a high left level, then this is the journal for them. Uh, Involve <clears throat> is a journal for math research that involves at least one undergraduate. The, the faculty can also be co-authors. And the, the level of it is the research is supposed to be at the level that would, uh, could appear in a normal, uh, decent, regular math journal. So it's real research. I think it's unique in that sense. Uh, so that's what the cover looks like. The name of the journal is Involve, a journal of mathematics, but Involve, and if you, uh, Google it, you'll find it. Uh, it's published by Mathematical Sciences Publishers. And um, that's all I really want to do is bring it to your attention. I have some sample copies, which I'm happy to leave so I don't have to carry them home. Anyway, thanks. Uh, a few facts first. Uh, this is Sandra Larson's, uh, the executive summary of Sandra Larson's large data math study of IBL. Uh, it's uh, about a three-page thick book. This is the last chapter with the conclusions. You, it's a handout out there. You can get it. You can recognize it by the yellow sentence, which is our conclusion. I think I'll read it. Learning gains and attitudinal changes were especially positive for groups that are often underserved by traditional lecture-based approaches, including women and lower achieving students. I really feel grateful that uh, I've been given this opportunity and the resources to uh, contribute to this IBL movement and the IBL community. And thanks to our great staff, this is the time to thank them. Over the back. <clears throat> That was Fain Brock and his uh, great staff. Uh, to his left is Norma Flores. You all know Norma. Norma, wave your hand. <laughs> and the others are uh, support uh, staff that are doing an excellent job. Robin Bush is not here. But uh, that team makes all this possible and makes the money, too. Thank you for me. Uh, also, a special thanks to Albert Lewis. Uh, I don't believe he's presented yet th at this program, but I uh, will hear from him later on today. And uh, Bill Hamlin. Uh, Bill, are you still here? Okay. All right, Bill, thank you both for uh, the infrastructure and the necessary action uh, that that is required to move things ahead. Also, over the last two years or so, we have had a leadership committee, various subcommittees, especially the Strategic Planning Committee. Uh, 
I feel very fortunate and grateful for this help. And thanks to you who are on the front lines of education reform. Thanks for everybody for attending and pass it on. So Angie and I are going to leave you with a couple of parting thoughts. Um, it's hard to follow Mr. Lucas though, so we'll be very brief. So this year's program, we tried to make very focused on you all and you came through in amazing ways. I was impressed by the number of parallel sessions. I was impressed by the comments made, the thoughtful nature of the discussions that happened. And that was you. And we appreciate that very much. So thank you all. And I'll just echo Jackie's thank you. It's every year I come to this, I learn something from everybody that's here. And hopefully you all appreciated the parallel sessions and the time to talk in between as well. And thank you to Harry Lucas and the staff and to everybody for coming. And hopefully we'll see you all next year and bring a friend next year too, right? There's other groups <laughs> we're not reaching. And I think if they come here, they'll find out more what inquiry-based learning is and how they can do it in their classrooms too. <laughs> And um, just to remind us about all of these online communities, and we do have a Twitter presence, a Facebook presence, we do have the website, find them. The dates for next year's conference are being considered right now. They'll get posted as soon as we know them so you can plan appropriately for next year. And like Angie said, we hope to see all of you back and bring other people with you that introduce them to our community. Thanks.